Well, let's get the program started. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, speaker, Dr. Deborah Jordan. Deborah Jordan is the Air Division Director for the United States U.S. Environmental Protection Agency's Region 9. She oversees about 100 staff members working with 45 state and local air monitoring agencies charged with improving air quality in the Pacific uh, Southwest. Dr. Jordan is responsible for enforcing the Clean Air Act on state and tribal lands and lending the region's efforts to address climate change. Dr. Jordan has been, with the Air, has been the Air Division Director since March 2004 after serving as Chief of Staff to the Regional Administrator. She has worked at EPA since 1989. She received her PhD in Chemical Engineering from the University of California, Berkeley, and a Master's and Bachelor's degree from the University of Kansas. So please help me welcome Dr. Deborah Jordan. Good morning, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Am I close enough to the mic? Well, before I get started, I want to tell you a little bit about myself uh, because I, I don't know a lot of you. But as Michael mentioned, um, I did earn my PhD in chemical engineering from Berkeley. And I really do consider myself a scientist, as I know many of you do. Um, and science, good science really underlies all of what we do in the air quality field. And as Michael said, for the last 25 years or so, I've been with EPA, most of that time in air quality. And the other key thing I want you to know going into my little talk this morning is that as we talk about why air monitoring is so important, because it underlies the regulatory decisions that we make. One reason I'm so passionate about talking about this with you is that I'm actually the person who makes a lot of these decisions in the region, or I recommend decisions to the EPA administrator for things like um, designating areas non-attainment and those kinds of things that really rely on monitoring. So for me, this is just personally and professionally really critical, and I'm just thrilled that you're all here to have this training today and tomorrow, and I couldn't be happier to be kicking it off. So thank you very much for coming. <clears throat> My purpose this morning really is to let you know how important the work that you do is, and um, I'm hoping that you'll really internalize this training over the next two days and take it with you into every every one of your work days and every opportunity that you have. So this morning, what I'd like to do is start with the overarching purpose of air monitoring, which as I see it is really to protect the public's health, and then go into the three key roles of good monitoring data. And if you get nothing else out of my talk, I hope that you will take with you what I see as these three key roles. And I will be reminding you of this. There will not be a quiz at the end, but I will be reminding you to, to try to take that with you. And then we'll talk a little bit about what happens when there are poor data, when we have poor data quality, how we assure good data quality, and of course, this is really what the training's all about, but I'm kind of speaking from my perspective as EPA Air Director, and then talk a little bit about some emerging issues and, and closing thoughts. So as I said, as I see it, really the overarching purpose of air quality monitoring is to protect the public's health by informing people about what the quality of the air is that we breathe. And as a result of that, people can make well-informed decisions about where and how we improve the air quality. And just looking back in time, you know, air pollution control programs in this country go back to the middle of the last century when the first air quality agency was begun in Los Angeles in 1945 and then in the next decade in the Bay Area. And then at the federal level, we actually did have a, um, a federal air pollution control act in the mid-50s, but it wasn't until the 1970 Clean Air Act amendments that the federal government got really serious about protecting people's health and, and understanding the air quality and then actually doing something about it. And the 1970 Clean Air Act amendments really set the stage for how we deal with air quality federally. 
And in turn, that um, helps us understand what the three key roles of good monitoring, monitoring data are in the regulatory world. I want to spend just a couple minutes looking at the structure of the Clean Air Act so that we're, we're going to see how important monitoring is and how it's used, and we can really get a good understanding of these three key roles in the regulatory program. <clears throat> so the most fundamental component of the Clean Air Act is really that EPA is required to set the national ambient air quality standards at, a, at levels adequate to protect the public's health and welfare. And there are two types of national ambient air quality standards. The primary standards are set to protect health, and the secondary ones are set to protect the public's welfare, which means things like protecting damage to crops and vegetation and animals. And we really focus mostly on the primary ones, but actually as we move along in time here in the future, we're going to be dealing with some secondary ones as well. The Clean Air Act also requires, um, and I don't know if you know this, if you've been thinking lately, why does EPA keep revising all these standards? Well, it's because the statute actually requires that EPA look at the standards every five years. And we have to do this for each of the criteria pollutants, and those are ozone, particulate matter, oxides of nitrogen, sulfur dioxide, carbon monoxide, and lead. So if actually for each of those pollutants, we're required to do that every five years. And when we do it, we have to consider the, all of the available scientific information and then make a decision as to whether we need to revise the NACs or whether we can leave it as it is. The there is a key role of monitoring data as we go through this process, and that is as part of the integrated science assessment. This is something that you all, and actually we in the regional office don't deal with that much. Um, most of the time, but I want you to be aware of it because it really is important. Um, and this slide, I'm just showing you this so you get a sense of how complicated the process is for EPA to set a national ambient air quality standard. Um, there's a lot in the news about are we going to lower the ozone standard. You probably have been hearing about that. This process that's laid out up here is a depiction of what that – it's a multi-year process, what's involved. And the key things to note are at the very top in the middle, the integrated science assessment is where air quality data come into play because it's the air quality data, the concentrations combined with the epide epidemiological studies that provide the information that EPA uses along with the risk and exposure assessment just down below it. Those all feed into an analysis by the Clean Air Science Advisory Committee and the public, and then EPA then on the far right begins its decision-making process and goes through, makes a proposed decision, which is the big blue um, figure on the left, and then makes a final decision. So my point is really just to say it's really complicated. It's a very scientifically based process that EPA undergoes, and air quality monitoring is actually an important part of that process, and that is the first key role that I want you to, um, to remember as you're, as you're leaving my talk today, in case there is a quiz. Okay. So this is really just the the sort of easy depiction of it, monitoring and epidemiological studies provide the review of the, um, of the NACs and we make a final decision. Now, when we do, here's, here's where what you do on a day-to-day -day basis comes into play. When EPA sets or revises the national ambient air quality standards, we have to determine whether areas are meeting the standard, those are, not, those are attainment areas, or not meeting the standard, and those are non-attainment areas. And very, most of the time, what we use to make that decision to, in a large part is the monitoring data for each of the areas. <clears throat> the data are also important in actually determining the geographic scope of the non-attainment area and in determining the design value, which really tells the regulators how much work they have to do to bring the area into attainment. So this is really the second key role, which is determining um, whether areas are attaining or not attaining a standard when it's set or revised and determining how much work has to be done to bring the area into attainment with the new air quality standard. <clears throat> And as you know, once areas are designated non-attainment, 
States have to develop SIPs to bring the non-attainment areas into attainment with their plans that include emission controls. And then as we go along, of course, the monitoring shows whether the area is improving, which hopefully it is, and ultimately whether the area is attaining the standard. And this is the third key role for the monitoring data is for ultimately EPA to determine is the area attaining. And believe me, from where I sit, there's nothing that the air quality agencies, you all and your bosses want to do more than bring areas into attainment and have EPA say formally, you're in attainment. And you wouldn't believe how many times we have little problems when we think the area is in attainment, but there are issues with the data, and we're going to be talking about that a little bit more later. But that is the third key role, determining that areas have come into attainment. Now, I just want to walk through a little example so you get a feel um, of what's involved as we set a national ambient air quality standard and revise it. And we'll, we're going to talk about ozone. This map shows the national monitoring network for the eight-hour ozone standard. And it consists of about 1,200 monitors across the country that are reporting data to AQS. And you can see a lot of those are in California. Um, and you all are responsible for those, so thank you very much. Um, this map shows the designations in Region 9 for the 1997 eight-hour ozone standard. And that was the 0.08 standard, which is really kind of 0.085. So that's the um, standard before last. So, But this is the result of the designations process. And the areas that are shown there range from the white areas, which are attainment areas, through mar you can't really see the yellow, but as the, as the shades get darker, the areas have a higher design value. You can, you can see that the extreme areas are that darkest shade of red. But when we make these designations, we have to say, what is the classification? You know, serious, severe, extreme, that depends on the air quality data, and that depends on all of you. Once the area is designated non-attainment then, we rely on the monitoring over time to tell us how is the area doing. And this is a trend line for ozone from 2000 to 2013 for three areas, um, South Coast on top, San Joaquin, and you can't really see Bay Area on the bottom, but it is hovering around the standard. The dashed red line is um, the ozone standard which, as we're going to talk about in a moment, was revised in 2008 down to, point, down to 75 parts per billion. So we like to, I use these trend lines all the time, which, you know, are totally based on the data, to say how, um, how are the control strategies actually working. And we happen to have used this for our regional administrator recently to show um, trends for ozone, and, and we put in place there a couple of the control strategies, uh, reformulated gasoline and the LEV standards, to show when those began to be implemented, and then you can look at the trend lines for ozone following that. Yes, the little arrow showing that the standard was revised, and we may have another little arrow the next time I talk with you, um, some, you know, in the next couple of years. OK, so once the, once the standard was revised, we then had to do another round of designations. And this is very intensive work. Um, Fletcher. Oh, it looks better on this one. Thank you, Fletcher. Absolutely. And Fletcher, did, can I, Fletcher, raise your hand. Fletcher, in my office, puts together these fabulous maps I can't tell you how many times I run to Fletcher and say, Fletcher, I need a map of the non-attainment areas. So, yes, you're right. And th this is um, a map showing the non-attainment areas for the revised eight-hour ozone standard. Um, we revised it in 2008. And again, the shadings indicate the, ver the um, various severities of the areas, with the darker being the more severe areas, starting with white. Uh, unclassifiable attainment, and then the tan is marginal, ranging from marginal, moderate is the pink, um, serious, severe, and then extreme is the darkest. Um, and by the way, uh, as you, you know, this won't surprise you, but if, as you look across the country, it's really California, we'll talk about this later, that has the worst air quality areas, and we're the only ones with extreme non-attainment areas um, in the country. So this is a simple depiction. The monitoring 
that you all are responsible for helps us determine non-attainment areas, which then leads to the control strategies and the rules to improve air quality. That's role number two. And role number three, determining attainment, which is where we all hope to end up in the not too distant future for each of the areas. So just in summary, monitoring contributes to the determination of the national ambient air quality standards. And this really is a constant process for all of the pollutants, determining where and by how much the air quality needs to improve and finally showing the trends and hopefully showing ultimately attainment. But I also want to go back to that overarching goal of air quality monitoring data that I mentioned in the first place, which is informing the public. And I do think it's important for us all to keep in mind that air quality monitoring does help to protect the public's health, not only in that regulatory scheme that I just went over, which is really important, but also just on a day-to-day -day basis to inform the public about the air that we breathe. Um, I think that we all realize that in the last several years, the public has become more and more interested in what the air quality is. They, the public relies on air now. The public, as we're gonna talk about a little bit later, sometimes relies on its own monitoring. But I think that it's important to know that we're not only part of that regulatory scheme, but we're part of letting the public know what the air quality is in their neighborhoods. Now I wanna spend just a few minutes talking about the possible consequences of poor air monitoring data. Um, this is what we want to avoid, and this is why we're all here. Um, but the training today and tomorrow is really all about how to make sure that the air quality data across California are consistently of high quality. And I'll just tell you a little story, which is that um, I became really particularly interested in assuring this consistent high quality air monitoring data a couple of years ago when EPA took a look at the air monitoring system in, in California. And I pulled together the air pollution control officers and I said, you know, we see some improvements that need to be made here. And what we're doing here today and tomorrow really feels to me like sort of the culmination of that effort in that we said, hey, we need to make sure that we're all on the same page about how to have good consistent air quality data. And that's what we're all here talking about today. But I do want to spend a few minutes on what can happen when there are problems with the data. And of course, this is mostly from my perspective um, where I sit. <clears throat> Looking back for just a moment at the first role, um, I'm not going to dwell on this, but if we don't have adequate air quality data to feed into the NAAQS determinations, um, you know, we have problems understanding that, that we really do have the best available science. Every five years, we're called upon to use the best available science. If we have fewer reliable data, we, we can't inform that health uh, impacts analysis um, in the way that we would like to. And looking at the second and third roles, you know, and this is really what, what I see on a on a day to day basis is what happens when we have poor air quality monitoring data. We're trying to determine non attainment areas. We're trying to determine design values. We're trying to determine whether an area has come into attainment. We might not be able to make good non attainment designations that we that, every, that the public and the agencies agree with if we have disagreements about the data. We might not be able to understand that we have the right design value for the agency to use in its air quality planning. And which and again, this is really important. We might not be able to determine um, that an area has come into attainment in a timely fashion. Uh, and that's important not only to the agencies and to us, but to the, um, to the regulated community. The regulated community feels the burden of having a non-attainment designation. It's looking to have an attainment designation as soon as it can. Why would we possibly not be able to use monitoring data? I've listed a couple of the, a few of the issues here. If there were critical quality assurance checks that were missed, if a monitor, a critical monitor is not operating, and we've seen this a number of times, and then if we have uh, inadequate documentation, that can affect the defensibility of our decisions. And it's important to focus on the word defensibility for a moment. I'm, I'm gonna talk about this 
in a, in a few minutes in a little bit more detail, but when EPA makes a decision, a regulatory decision, we have to feel that it's the best, highly defensible decision that we can make. And when there are any questions about the data going into the decision, that really causes us to pause. And I can't tell you how many times I've had that happen um, in decisions that I've made across the region where we think we know what the decision is, we go into it, and then I get a briefing on the data and I find out, oh, there are this, this, and this problem with the data. And then I have to make a decision as to whether I'm going to recommend proceeding with that decision, that it's defensible enough uh, or not. And there have been many times when we've had to stop in our tracks and go back and either get additional documentation, if, it, if we can do that, or we've had to delay a decision on um, non-attainment or attainment in particular because one of these problems or a problem like it was encountered and it wasn't something where we could go back and, and in a reasonably short period of time get the adequate documentation. So um, just to talk a little bit more about these, and I know you guys are going to get into more detail, missed samples have meant that we had a different design value for an area than um, we otherwise would have. I, I remember a situation where there were PM 2.5 samples um, that were, were missed. The design value was really higher than it should have been, and um, then the samples were found and the design value came down. But there's a big difference in the control strategy when you have a higher or a lower design value. It can actually mean millions of dollars for the regulated community. It can have really significant consequences. Um, when we have missing data, there's lots of work that has to be done to try to produce a reasonable regulatory decision if it can be done. So these are decisions and consequences that are important to a lot of people out there. <clears throat> This is an example where, and this is not in this state, I'll tell you, this, this particular example. We weren't able to designate an area non-attainment because of issues with the data. And in that particular case, um, it was issues around quality assurance um, documentation. The quality assurance program wasn't well documented. And um, this was a significant air quality problem in a community. Um, and I feel comfortable talking a little bit more about this. It was not in California, but this is a situation where we wanted to designate the area non-attainment. We knew that they really needed to put in place a strong control strategy to bring the levels down, the levels of the pollutant down for this community, and we actually couldn't move forward because of the QA documentation really not being there. And we ended up having to wait about, it really totaled up to be almost a year before, um, between the time we thought we were going to be able to move forward and the time we actually were able to make the non-attainment designation. And um, I, I really pause on this particular one because this example was one where that issue around the data, QA procedures and documentation really led to a delay of a year in getting the, the state to, because the area was designated on attainment finally, to put its control strategy in place. And I know in California we're so used to being really proactive and, you know, maybe if, if we had this situation, we think, well, in our agency, we'd go ahead and get that control strategy in place anyway because we know the community's suffering and we know we need to bring the air quality to a better level, to a more healthy level. In this particular situation, it really wasn't that way, and it was really actually the non-attainment designation that forced the situation to move forward and to improve the air quality. So that one, it really, really did make a difference. Um, and the other thing I wanted to mention, and I hear about this a lot, and I, you may not, is when um, we're trying to designate an area to attainment, you know, which depends on the data, um, that really affects permitting. It, you know, doesn't it, do, do permittees have to get offsets? If they're not attainment, they have to get offsets, which can be very costly, or do they not have to get offsets? If they're attainment, they don't have to. Um, it, we actually had a situation in California where we had a little problem with the data, and we weren't able to designate an area attainment as quickly as we wanted. And I will tell you, I was under all kinds of pressure to um, move this forward because the, the um, 
uh, permitting part of that regulatory agency wanted to be wanted to have that attainment designation so that they their permittees did not have to pay for offsets and it's really important and anyway we eventually worked it out but um, there were some um, some data issues that that slowed things down the other thing I wanted to bring to your attention is that over the last few years the public has become much more savvy about air quality monitoring data we have received comments um, as we've done um, SIP actions, we've done uh, put out designations, or we've taken actions on network plans on things like siting monitors, data completeness, flow verification checks, calibration checks, uh, QAP adoption and execution and co-location requirements. These are the kinds of things that you know only you guys in the know it used to be. Uh, it used to be that only you guys in the know were really savvy about these things, but actually the public um, and non-governmental organizations have become much more savvy about these issues in the last few years. And you may not realize that so much where you sit. I don't know if you do, but um, we've received comments on all of these things. And so we have to make sure that, um, you know, we're doing everything um, just right. And in, in particular, for the first time ever, we were challenged recently on our approval of an annual monitoring network plan because of lack of near roadway PM 2.5 monitors at that point in time, and this was a few years ago when it began, and lack of maximum concentration PM 2.5 monitor. And, um, you know, this really kind of took us aback back when it happened um, because we'd never been challenged on an approval of an annual network plan before. And um, this has caused us to be much more um, rigorous and um, consistent about how we do these air, these annual network plan reviews. So if you're wondering if this is something that you deal with and you're wondering why is EPA so, you know, got this checklist and everything, it really is because we, the NGOs out there and the general public have become much more knowledgeable and really pay attention and we have to really be very clear and consistent and make sure that everything um, is done as it should, as it should be. And then lastly, here on our, you know, things to kind of be aware of, we have unique challenges here in California. And, and so I want to point out that issues around air monitoring really are especially consequential here because we have the worst ozone and particulate matter issues in the country. We do have that geography and meteorology that are conducive to poor air quality. Um, we have all these entities involved in the air quality and just in the air quality, both monitoring and control strategy development, federal, state, local, tribes, others. Sources can be very complex. And as I mentioned, we have a number of active NGOs out there looking over our shoulders every step of the way. So these things all combine to mean that um, we have to have a good, rigorous system in place, and we have to you know, do that kind of, uh, you know, sharpening of the saw, if you will, where we go back and make sure that everything is just as rigorous as it, sh as it should be. So how can we assure that we do have good air quality monitoring data? Well, of course, um, you're in this two-day training, which is, um, which is really critical. But what I really want to um, make a pitch for is primary quality sh assurance organizations and how they can really provide support so that we get the good, consistent data across the state. Um, I think that the PQAOs can help to catch issues earlier um, so that we make sure the data are used for the intended purpose. And I'd like for you to think of the ARB PQAO as a resource. And um, I know we're going to have different perspectives on PQAOs discussed this morning, but from my perspective, it's really critical. And I appreciate that you're all here, you know, getting this training and that I hope when you go back to your jobs that you have a little bit different view of the PQA or maybe than you had coming in and that you think of it really as a resource. And then I just wanted to spend um, a few minutes on a few emerging issues that I see from where I sit and I know that you may be seeing these same issues as well. Um, so I'm just going to mention three emerging issues and the first is near roadway monitoring. I call this an emerging issue really because it's a work in progress and as you probably know there are at least 35 million people, and I think probably more, living within about 300 feet of a major roadway. And not surprisingly to any of us, studies show that concentrations of many criteria pollutants are highest near roadways. So we are in the process of 
with some of you deploying NO2 monitors and then PM 2.5 monitors near roadways. And, you know, once we have three years of data, we will be looking at those data as we make decisions down the road about, down the road, so to speak, about um, non-attainment areas. And this is going to be a real change um, and something that um, people who've been concerned about this issue have been looking to the regulatory agencies to for some time. Um, and so I think it's going to really be a change in how we look at uh, people's exposure to um, high concentrations of pollutants. The second issue I want to bring to your attention is sensor technology. And, you know, we have every week, it seems to me, we hear about some new um, innovation in personal air, air sensors, you know, that are the size of our cell phones or maybe in our cell phones where people can, you know, take this around and feel that they know what the concentration is of um, a criteria pollutant or a toxic pollutant near them. And this, in some ways, is great. People can become empowered to, to understand what the, um, what the trends are in their communities. But at the same time, there are lots of challenges for those of us who are actually in the business of air quality monitoring. You know, how good are the data? Um, how can, should and can we use them? It's one thing about how they inform citizens. It's another thing about how do they inform us in our decision-making process. So it's something to keep our eyes on, and EPA is keeping its eyes on this issue. Um, we, have, I put a, we have a few we, um, websites listed here that you can go to if you want some more information. Um, but the point is that we, have, we continue to um, keep a very close eye on this issue. We try to understand how good these devices are, and we have a workshop planned for um, next month, our fourth, our fourth uh, workshop on these sensors, uh, where we're looking at what are the opportunities, what's been going on, what's the late, latest science on um, these personal air sensors. And then the final topic that I wanted to mention is um, climate change and greenhouse gas monitoring. Um, some of you may be aware that EPA plans a big announcement next week on um, a uh, greenhouse gas regulation, and if you aren't, if you hadn't been hearing about that, keep your eyes and ears open next week for an announcement at a very high level. Oops, I went back. At a very high level about um, an action that EPA is taking. But as EPA in California is already moving forward, of course, aggressively on um, mitigating greenhouse gas emissions, and the federal government is now about to do more than it had in the past. But what I wanted to point out is that. Um, Along with that, it's important to really understand the science behind it. And again, underlying that is the monitoring. Um, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration for the federal government is in charge of greenhouse gas monitoring. Um, NOAA monitors CO2, methane, um, nitrous oxide, and actually CO in a number of different um, monitoring systems. The one you may have heard about is the, the four ob observatories. One is on Mauna Loa, and that's the one you probably hear about most often where the concentration, the current concentration of CO2 is given. And that's really used internationally um, for, you know, looking at how is the world doing. But Mauna Loa, um, the South Pole, American Samoa, and Barrow, Alaska are the locations of those observatories where, um, you know, that those monitors are relied on um, by people around the world. There's also a, a monitoring uh, station of tall towers, the tall tower network. There's an international set of monitoring sites, and then there are aircraft uh, monitoring uh, greenhouse gas levels across North America. So those, those four monitoring networks go into NOAA's work um, to keep track of the various greenhouse gas concentrations across the country and across the world, and that in turn goes into the research that people are doing about greenhouse gases. I just think that's interesting because we're going to be hearing more and more about this in the future. And again, as we put control strategies in place, it's important to have that underlying science that you all do. And in this case, it's, it's not all of us. For the most part, it is NOAA. And I know that there's some greenhouse gas monitoring across California, and I'm not that familiar with it, but I'm sure that that's going to be an area of increased interest on the part of the public in the future. So those are the things that I wanted to cover today. Um, 
And again, I just really appreciate all of your uh, attending this two-day training, and um, I'm very excited to, to see you and to be part of it. So thank you.